So, we have another speaker coming up on this stage, and he's going to talk to you about what awaits the fundraising scheme in 2018. Is it going to go up or is it going to go down? And I would like to introduce to you Lou Clarson, and he is a blockchain evangelist, venture capitalist, managing partner at Newtown Partners, which is a blockchain investment and advisory services company. He is also an early venture investor in blockchain startups, and he's started a couple of his own ventures, including clicks to customers, since a site, and traffic synergy. He is also considered the go-to strategist in terms of technology, with deep expertise in designing, building, merchandising, and marketing online and mobile software products and services. A very warm welcome to you, Lou. Guten Tag, Berlin. Thanks for hosting me. I'm having so much fun here at the conference and also in your beautiful city. So Newton Partners uh, invest in early stage technology businesses and we've been very fortunate to have invested in some of the early winners, I think, in this space. So, for example, Block One, the developers of EOS, BitGo, developing interesting multi-signature uh, multi wallets. Uh, Protocol Labs developing the decentralized internet, IPFS, Zeppelin creating a smart contracting platform, and String who are creating the Definity um, blockchain protocol. But these are the kinds of investments that we've been relatively passive in, and I would like today to talk a little bit more about that we have been in very actively involved in management and setting strategy and what that tells us about where the industry has been over the last two years and where it is going to go in 2018. And our story starts off at the end of 2016, early 2017, when we did the first token sale for an augmented reality game called Augmentors that we had invested in that year. And the principle was really simple. We wanted to create a an in-game currency, and we wanted to tokenize the creatures that will eventually be used in the game. We sold about 1,000 BTC at about $1,000 per BTC at the time, and went ahead and produced in the process of developing that game. And that game is going to launch in Q3 2018. What was very interesting about that is that, for those of you that can remember only about a year ago, uh, it was very common at the time to kind of like sell what you could and burn what you couldn't. And what we quickly realized is that after we had completed that token sale, the lawyer said to us, hell no, you can't do that. Um, and that the SEC, in fact, views that process as a pretty good indicator um, of it being a security. And so we redesigned the token economics there. And I think we were probably one of the first projects to do a two-tier token structure. So we have a reserve currency, which is called Databits. And we have an ingrained currency, which is not a token, does not trade on a secondary exchange, but is nevertheless tethered to that reserve currency. And so it has a couple of advantages. The one most obvious is that you can remove some of the volatility that exists in the secondary market, but that you also then don't have an uneconomical burn mechanism that prevents you um, from, for example, paying for uh, the application store fees. And so it still is a very similar kind of concept in terms of uh, there's a, a buyback mechanism, but um, not a burn mechanism. And the next project that we were very involved in takes us to July 2017 in a project which my uh, business partner runs, Benny Lingham. And Civic is effectively a decentralized identity marketplace. And in the first incarnation of its token economy, we had designed the token in a fairly generalized way so that it would be used as a medium of exchange inside that economy and would be used to pay for identity validation. But two weeks ago at Consensus, we published a completely updated and revamped token econ economy. And this time around, we applied game theory, mechanism design, and some systems theory to it. And we designed an economy that, when fully implemented, is going to enable Civic to be a completely decentralized autonomous organization that will not need to have any kind of arbitration, will not require any kind of centralized governance, and in fact, will not even make use of oracles. And we think that that gives you a pretty good indication of where these de decentralized business models are going in the future. And finally, at the end of 2017, uh, one of the projects that we had invested in, which is a financial services platform serving African markets, 
we decided that it was really important for them to have a cryptocurrency that would enable them to do cross-border, zero-fee financial services instantly and enable micropayments that could not be served through mobile money or cash. And so we issued a cryptocurrency called Dialer. Dialer runs on micro Raiden at the moment, and once fully implemented, will be effectively uh, part of the Raiden network. But it's designed also in such a way where it is effectively platform agnostic. And so even though it doesn't have its own blockchain, it can effectively run once fully implemented on any blockchain. And what that enabled us to do is something very interesting. We were able to the first time to see what it would look like if you implemented a private currency uh, in a way which was slightly more decentralized initially, but nevertheless allowed you to control some of the parameters that would enable the regulators to feel comfort that there was a person behind the project, at least initially. And so when we launched Dala uh, not too long ago in May, we, we, we got 50,000 users of that cryptocurrency within 10 days. And those users are so actively engaging using that technology uh, without fully understanding exactly what it is that we're getting 17,000 transactions per day on that network and 60 new users per minute. And those users are using it three times per day. So again, a pretty good indication that the technology is solving a very real purpose. But what we came up against once we started talking to partners and saying, well, could we use this, for example, as, as the currency in a renewable energy implementation in Uganda? Or could we use this for, say, small-scale farmers um, to, to pay for fertilizer loans? Is we came up against this wall of crypto asset volatility. And we realized that although there is some data to suggest today that in some ways it's possible that the current volatility in crypto assets is really just a function of the fact that the market is that immature, and that eventually, given enough time, enough participation, we'll find that the volatility will reduce in the same way that some of the volatility was removed from, say, the formal gold trading markets. We're still not 100% sure whether or not that is in fact true. And another data point that we came across is this very interesting little piece over here. And this was uh, presented at consensus by the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And it kind of tells us the story as follows. For the past 20 years, although real GDP growth rates have been pretty stable between the US and Japan, there has still been price volatility between the yen and the US dollar. And so it is possible that our desire to create a stable coin that has no volatility is in fact a fool's game, and that volatility is something that is inherent to these crypto assets and something that you cannot design away. And there is a whole argument to make about whether or not, in fact, you can economically stabilize any kind of stable coin over long periods of time um, in a bear market and against all possible eventualities. It's actually possible that it is not economical. Which takes us to the situation that we're in at the moment. And so here we have something which has attracted a lot of attention as a speculative asset. We are still not 100% sure exactly how best to use it. I think the technology is actually fairly immature. And so we're kind of like playing a little. And the problem is that there are retail investors that are kind of not playing anymore. And so they're attracting the attention of regulators at a time when we actually need a bit more time to figure out what is this thing that we are working with. Which kind of takes us to South Florida, and more specifically the orange groves. And the reason why is because whether we like to believe it or not, Regulations across the world, insofar as crypto assets are concerned, are dominated by the ridiculous regulations that exist in the US. And those regulations are dominated by something in the absence of your crypto asset fitting the definition of a security in the Securities Act, you're, you're going to be compared to something called the Howey test. And what that Howey test is effectively saying, and it comes from a court case from the 1950s about people investing in orange groves in Florida, believe it or not. And it's about, there are effectively four prongs to the Howey test. And if you pass all four, then it's a pretty good indication that you're security. And if you fail one or two of them, it's a pretty good indication that you're not issuing a security. And you'd rather, if you're trying to design a utility, you really don't want to be issuing a bad security. And so what the Howey test does is, is as I said, the four prongs are, 
Was there an investment of money? Was it into a common enterprise? Was there an expectation of profit? And is that profit likely to be the result of the management effort of others? And so why is this important to us? Is that when you look at it that way, it's fairly obvious that any crypto asset issuance is going to pass the first two parts of the Howey test. But if you decentralize your business model, if you enable people to create, if you enable incentives in the network that enable people to perform the actions in the network without direct management interference, you're more likely to create something that is not actually going to be classified as a security. And I think perhaps more importantly, what it also tells us is that these are the kinds of business models that are both desirable and are less likely to be actively regulated. And so where does that take us? in 2018. Well, we know that we sold about $6 billion worth of tokens and coins in initial offerings in 2017, and we were we're about $9 billion in and halfway through the year. I think that what we're going to find, unfortunately, though, is that we're in a bear market. And in this bear market, the prices of these crypto assets are highly correlated with the prices of the first two projects, BTC and F. And so, whether we like it or not, these prices don't reflect any kind of underlying utility. They move with the other assets. And I think it's because so few of these coins and tokens have actually been implemented inside those networks and actually have t utility um, that it makes it difficult to price. Similarly, the ones that are live have a, have a fairly general purpose uh, use in them, which once again makes it difficult for you to price utility. And so I think that we're going to continue to be in the situation where these prices are going to move up and down together until we have a situation where you've got real utility being created in these decentralized networks. And I hope that some of the projects that we're involved in will be some of those that will decouple themselves. I think the other thing that we're going to find is that token sales are increasingly more private sales. There is very little appetite actually for token sales in the public market, and frankly, it's I believe that these assets are very high risk and should not be offered to retail investors who do not understand those risks. And so I think what, what we're finding with many of the projects that we're involved in and that we've, we've spoken with is that these token sales are becoming completely private. They are being offered to institutional or rather um, more sophisticated investors and they're being offered to users. And I think that those are the right people who should be buying these tokens. I think that what we're also finding is that uh, there are many new platforms to consider in terms of doing new token issuances um, which have different characteristics from, say, first and second generation blockchains. So we're going to see, for example, that EOS mainnet is going to go live on June 1st. And I think that we're going to see very interesting things come out of such a well-funded project that is going to be able to enable ecosystem development around a different kind of technology. And whether or not that proves to be the most dominant technology is not really the point. I think it takes everything forward and gives other options. And I think that what we're also going to find, and this is perhaps something which was a little bit more surprising to us, is that Stellar is increasingly being adopted to more and more, by more and more projects. And I think it's this realization that um, it's actually fairly easy to work with. It has good throughput, quite stable. And although it has limited smart contracting capabilities, those will also be improved towards the end of 2018. And Stella also has funds available to be able to do ecosystem development. So I think that choice is good, and I think it'll come down to, to the characteristics of what you're trying to do as to which blockchain you choose to issue on. Which kind of takes me to the, the final point in this idea of security tokens and security exchanges. And I think my view on that is that we're kind of missing the point when we get super excited about security tokens. Because for the most part, people talk, it, talk about these tokens in very general terms. And they say, well, you know, all these securities were suddenly going to tokenize. And the reality is that we kind of need to look back at how did this industry or how did token sales start with to begin with? Why did they even, why were they created? And the reality is that it is really hard for early stage technology startups to get access to risk capital. And so in some ways, what this was, was a, a way for early contributors to benefit from the work that they were going to put into the development of those networks. And if we're in a regulatory environment now where we're saying, well, okay, fine, let's do the initial 
issue to only accredited investors and we'll call it a security. In fact, we'll even structure it like, say, priced equity. Then what we're going to end up is a mess. And the reason why we're going to end up with a mess with those unlisted equity securities being tokenized is because most projects will not be able to raise enough from those token issuances. There are restrictions in terms of the transferability or exchangeability of unlisted securities. Those unlisted securities cannot be made available to just about anybody in many jurisdictions. They often have to be made available to sophisticated investors or accredited investors. And there are also other challenges that you have when you're dealing with a real security, and that is that you need to identify a buyer and seller adding extra friction into this process. And so the co combined effect of all of these things and this perception that it is going to be easy for you to tokenize and list these unlisted securities is that you're actually going to end up with a lot of stuff that has no liquidity and that will effectively remove the reason why we tokenize these things in the first place. And so as much as I like to believe that eventually we will tokenize securities and we'll be able to do wonderful things, I don't think that the first generation of securities are the interesting ones. I think it's once we have more sophisticated technology, more mature platforms that we can do the next generation of securities which have got smart contracting capabilities built into them. And so while we're at it, and while we're kind of sacrificing sacred cows, let's talk about whether or not it is even necessary to do any more token issuances. Why don't we just like use the ones that are already there? Why don't you use Bitcoin? Why don't you use Ethereum? And I hear that so many times that I'm actually kind of like, I was like, eventually I need to talk about this. And the reality is that the answer is very simple. It's an economic one. And it goes as follows. If I need to bootstrap the network effects of a network and I have a zero cost base, I'm much more capable of economically creating those network effects and accelerating those network effects. If I have a zero cost base, I'm much more capable of paying outsized rewards to people for early network participation, which again increases the rate of adoption and increases the rate that these network effects will accelerate. And as long as I can create something called same side and cross side, side network effects, which effectively means that I'm creating utility in that network, I'm not giving away shit for free. And so it's important that we get the economics of these new issuances right, but that we also understand that right now, the fact that existing platforms exist, the fact that we've already issued these currencies doesn't mean that this has all been established. I think there's lots of room for new projects doing valuable things to do new issuances, to create the network effects they need in order to test whether or not this is in fact um, a dead end or something that's viable for the future. So I would encourage responsible issuances of new tokens and cryptocurrencies to continue. And so what does 2018 look like? I think that some of the best practices that we're going to see in 2018 is that people are going to go back to good old angel investing and they're going to do convertible notes um, and those convertible notes that we've seen convert under different circumstances into either priced equity or tokens or sometimes just remain debt. And I think that tokenizing that is not necessary. I think that it's pretty clear from the munchy guidance that the SEC gave that you don't want to build an MVP or a minimum viable product of your product using token sale proceeds. And so you need to go and raise money first. But perhaps as importantly, what you don't want to do if you're not issuing a protocol coin, you don't want to be having to deal with market validation and creating a microeconomy at exactly the same time in your network. You're gonna, the success rate is going to be lower than if you focus on getting initial market validation and, in fact, product market fit. And once you have that, tokenizing and decentralizing the business model. I think that some of the other considerations here is if you're going to issue a protocol coin, don't assume that just because your technology is good that anybody's going to care about your coin. And I think we're going to find that despite the fact that for 2017 we were led to believe that all value will accumulate to protocols in terms of this fat protocol theory, the reality is that many of those protocol coins will become useless even if the technology is eventually used. And I think that Further, if you're going to do a medium of exchange token, it's useful to understand that it is exceptionally difficult to get a flat and wide distribution um, that is necessary to actually make it usable as a unit of account of a medium of exchange. These are really, really hard problems, and we don't really have all the answers yet. We're kind of giving it a bash and hoping that eventually somebody is going to be able to figure this out. 
So let's be mindful of the fact that if we're going to be experimenting, we need to be responsible with retail investors. And so what does the end game kind of look like for 2018? I think we're going to find that despite a bit of a slow start, we're going to have about $30 billion in token issuance sales. Most of those actually are going to be backloaded to security tokens at the end of 2018. And I really hope that we're responsible with those as well. And I think that the future ultimately is super bright. But what we shouldn't forget is the old law of don't overestimate the impact that the technology is going to have in the short term, and don't underestimate the impact that the technology is going to have in the long term. Thank you. Would you like to maybe take one question? Sure. Has anybody got any questions? Maybe we can take one question. We've got some time. Anybody? Cool. Over there? Hello. Um, I completely agree with you about uh, everything you said. Uh, I'm, I was just curious about the, the example of the, the game you mentioned with the two tokens. Yeah. Can you, can you explain that again, please? Okay, sure. So we wanted something that could trade on the secondary market, especially since we already had backers. But we wanted to remove some of the volatility of the secondary market and we wanted to remove the burn function. So originally, as it was conceived, you would need to buy back those tokens and you would burn them. Um, and that way, um, you would effectively reduce the number of tokens in circulation. And theoretically, you would increase the value of the token. Um, but the reality is that we wanted something. We eventually had to go back and we had to design something that didn't have a, an automatic redemption function and wasn't effectively the equivalent of giving a dividend in value back to original backers. And so the second token um, serves the function of the in-game currency, which is, which is, although it's linked to the first currency, uh, it is less likely to be volatile because it doesn't trade on a secondary market. And um, whereas the, first, the, the, the underlying reserve currency of the game can be used across other games and it can, um, and it can effectively f perform a reserve function. So if you, if you play mobile games, it will be the equivalent of like you've got, say, gold and emeralds. So we tokenize the emeralds, and we're using the gold in the game. OK. I think that we're done. Cool. Thank you so much, Gonzalo.